All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new week. Uh, let's just begin this time with a word of prayer. Now, uh, so any one of us can please lead in prayer before we start our session. Let's go ahead. Anybody can start. And pray. Yes. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come to you. Thank you for this morning, for your goodness and grace, Lord. Thank you for this time, Lord, for this class. As we are learning, Lord, help us to understand and receive. Let eyes of our understanding be open, that we know how to do things of you, Lord Jesus. Let everything become easy. Lord, we surrender to your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Siddharth. All right. So... Just a quick uh, review of what we did last week. Uh, let me just present the notes here. So, so last week we talked about the, the sense of, of becoming a cell church. First thing, we talked about how uh, we have to change our mindset, right? uh, continuously raise up leader, leaders. So every time you know, we think of the life group, the, or even if you're starting a life, you're already part of a life group, our mind should always think of, okay, I need to raise, raise leaders. Then, uh, you know, you have a single task that is to build a cell group. Uh, and then the essence of a cell church, relationships, participation, empowering, focuses on Jesus, not on any person. Uh, outreaches, you can do it within your cell groups. You can have two or three cell groups together, which is networking, uh, to do any kind of outreach. And, and then prayer, uh, we talked a little bit about this and how uh, prayer is the foundation of a cell group, right? Uh, being a cell group leader, uh, prayer should be priority, get the Holy Spirit to uh, you know, receive from the Holy Spirit, hear from the Holy Spirit, uh, because a strong cell group is, is formed through the Holy Spirit, right? We need the anointing, we need protection, we need to have unity, uh, healings and miracles. Now, all of these things are supernatural things, right? So we cannot get them out of natural methods. Yes, planning and execution, strategy, all that is important. Uh, but prayer will help us to, you know, in, in terms of a cell group or even a church uh, where the anointing of the Holy Spirit is poured out, God protects uh, uh, the church, protects the people within the community. There's unity, there's salvation, there's miracles, there's healings, there's, there's a work of the Holy Spirit. Now, that cannot be achieved through strategy, right? Uh, so prayer is integral. Right. Uh, so today, uh, we just move on from this. These are just the different types of cell groups. Uh, and I'm sure that most of us know it. Uh, area cell groups, music cell groups, prayer cell groups, men's, women, uh, youth, adults, single moms, so many, so many uh, cell groups. But what I want to get to this today is talk a little bit about cell groups, uh, youth cells, right? Now, the reason I thought we'll just talk about this is because when we see what's happening around us now, uh, a lot of youth have a lot of questions. They have been exposed to the, so many things of the, of the world, uh, which is some of some of which are good, some of which are uh, evil, some of which uh, you know we as parents or we as leaders must protect and guide our youth. Right. Many a times, our our youth are lost. Right? They they don't know where to go. Right? What should I do in life? Now, uh, so I just thought we'll talk a little bit about youth cells. Right. So what is a youth led cell group? A youth led cell group is basically a group of twelve youth from different backgrounds. They come together, meet together for prayer, edification, fellowship. You know, just. Uh, being there for each other and together doing something for the Lord, right? Now, why are youth cell groups important? This may not be in your notes, but youth cell groups are important because a youth can identify with another youth, right? Now, so, for example, uh, you know, if there's somebody who's in their late uh, 20s, getting into their early 30s, 
right? Maybe still not married. Uh, they they will gel well with you know even if you put them in a family cell group, or even if they if you put them in a men's group or a women's group, right? Uh, it, it doesn't uh, you know they they'll be able to manage. But youth, it's a different story, right? Because now youth have different kinds of questions, different problems, and youth nowadays are willing to. You know, they, they don't hide like, you know, I remember the early, uh, you know, 2000s and 2005, 2010, that era, uh, you know, it was very, uh, the youth wouldn't share much. Right? They would always keep it to themselves. But now, nowadays, one of the th things that I am noticing is that youth are very open, right? Uh, they openly discuss uh, what's happening. They openly share. They, uh, so things have changed. Right, so the way we lead a youth cell group must also change, right? Uh, over time, right? Over time, it changes. So, what is the format of a youth-led cell group? Right, uh, a, a cell group meeting again. The format can be the same, right? About ninety minutes. Uh, uh, now, uh, we at APC we have a lot of youth cell groups as youth boys as youth girls. Uh, so one of the things we encourage them is not to be rigid, right? Because youth, you know, <clears throat> they they like to try different things. They like to talk about different things, right? Now, one of the things that we always focus on, yes, is Sunday sermons must be discussed, but we also give youth uh, a love for youth LGs to spend more time in connecting with each other, relaxing. Uh, 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 you know, uh, with each other, right? So, some of the ways is food or snacks is to start off with, or you can start off with worship. You know, youth like the whole aspect of worship, so you can start with worship. So, these are just examples. You can do it however you'd like icebreaker or a game, uh, uh, and then you share your vision statement, and you have the cell topic discussion. Uh, which is the Sunday sermon, and and then you have some ministry time praying for each other, right? Uh, and 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 now what is so different about this and the other uh, group, uh, the other cell groups? What we train our youth leaders is we tell them just go easy, right? Uh, you don't have to, you know, say, oh, we have to do it. You know, we have to pray for twenty minutes now. So yes, all of this is important, but it's also now if I, it, it, you know, only if somebody is willing to share with me. So for example, I'm, uh, uh, you know, I'm a youth leader. If I don't spend time with the youth, how will they come and share with me? They will not. Right? They they just be like, okay, I'm going to life group, so they'll go. Uh, but eventually, if they're not able to open up, if they're not able to discuss, uh, you know, uh, their concerns or what they're going through in life, then eventually they will stop coming to the life group. Right. So, as a youth leader, it is very important to be sensitive to what is happening around. Right. Uh, you know, some of the things that our youth leaders do, uh, not only cell group leaders, but our youth leaders as well, is on a constant uh you know they always get in touch meet with each other go have coffees together spend time together they uh you know they we play a lot of games right sports so for example there's badminton there's basketball there's different. what does it do it helps build relationships and and people begin to share share how they're feeling how well, how things are in their life and that's when a youth life group, a youth cell group becomes effective, right? So what is one of the challenges in the church? One of the main challenges is how to develop and train youth leaders and uh, adult leaders, right? Uh, as as you choose youth leaders, eventually as they keep, you know, leading, uh, probably they get married, they can continue on to be adult uh, leaders, right, in the church or, uh, in any ministry within the church, uh, but if they choose to move on and to do something else, that's up to them. But uh, no, normally, right? Youth leaders, they after even after they get married, and uh, you know they begin to serve in the adult church. But 
how do we develop and train youth leaders? Right? How do we disciple them? Right? Now, here's a few things, right? Uh, these are just a few points, and I'll add to it, but I want to begin with this. Uh, be in depth when you're talking to them, right? Uh, be vulnerable, be revealing in the sense, let them know that, you know, you're not the only one going through problems, right? Meaning they are not the only one who are going through problems and challenges. That even we have gone through it uh, as youth, right? Uh, using, uh, you know, probing questions. I recently, uh, last week, I was talking to a gentleman from, young, a young man from church, and he was saying, you know, I am addicted to smoking, right? Um, and I'm just not able to give it up. Right? I'm not able to, and I feel guilty after that. Uh, I don't know what to do, right? And, you know, I, I was very sad that he's not able to overcome it. It's very easy to say, you know what, you're not praying. You have to ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit only can empower you. That may be the, that is the truth. Uh, but there's a way to deal with him because he knows he's trying his best. And he's, this is, you know, this is a stronghold in his life. So he needs help. Already he's down. Bringing him, uh, bringing condemnation is not going to help that person right now. Right? So how can I help him? That should be our attitude. How can I help this person? So, you know, some of the things that, you know, you know, I just mentioned to him was, you know, oh, there are many of them who go through problems like this, right? Uh, you're also smoking, but there are others who go through, you know, uh, maybe it's uh, uh, you know, media or maybe it is, you know, uh, pornography. Some of them, it's different, different things, right? Uh, but we can all overcome it because we all have the Holy Spirit inside us. So I just began to talk to him and uh, just telling him to take small steps, right? And you know, just asking questions. When do you feel, you know, this urge? Is it usually in the morning? Is it, or is it in the evenings? Um, and then they become honest, right? They just begin to share with us, right? So, as youth leaders, some of the things we uh, pointers that we always give our youth leaders is uh, don't bring condemnation, don't mock, don't ridicule people. Uh, don't have the attitude of holier than thou, meaning, uh, oh, I'm so holy at such a young age, how come you are not able to do it? That's that's not what we want. Uh, but we are not only depending on, you know, our experience, but we also, you know, bring in the word. Here's the point, your message, right? We give, uh, uh, give him the word, maybe share messages, share, uh, you know, now with so much available online, share uh, maybe those two minute messages, five minute inspirational sermons, uh, a hard hitting word and the, let the word minister to them, right? Uh, uh, and when you're looking at leaders, uh, when, you, to, when we are discipling leaders, we allow them to, you know, uh, journey along with us, right? So we, we tell them, we tell them where we have failed. We encourage them to, you know, take bold steps to come out of their comfort zones. Uh, so these are additional things that we can do in terms of training youth leaders, right? Now, sometimes youth leaders may not know what to say to, you know, when it comes to mentoring and, you know, people may have queries and uh, so other youth may have, you know, things that they're going through, which may be overwhelming. They can always contact their youth pastor or the cell group pastor uh, or the, uh, the the pastor, the senior pastor, and just share their uh, thoughts and all of that. So, uh, but raising up youth leaders, developing them, training them uh, is very, very important, right? Um, and one of the things we always emphasize is uh, being an example, right? I cannot say something and do something else because youth are very very smart they learn they watch and they learn they see um, and every time they they see if we are saying something and we're doing something else they very freely they they will, they will call it out 
that. Uh, but as youth leaders uh, and as pastors, uh, always develop and train youth leaders. Look out for them, right? Uh, sometimes, you know, there'll be youth leaders who are, you know, there will be people, youth, who just come to church, they're serving every Sunday, but they never saw themselves as youth cell leaders. But they're serving every Sunday in church. Give them opportunities. See if they're capable, right? And it's okay. Allow them to make mistakes. Correct them when they make mistakes, right? Making mistakes is all right. You look at uh, the Lord Jesus, uh, you know, when he chose his uh, the 12, almost all of them made some mistake or the other. Um, I'm sure they all did, right? but Jesus you know, encouraged them through them. Right? Uh, and uh, another way, another aspect that we have just started in youth cell groups is where we encourage them to ask questions in the sense they you know through it could be work questions, it could be uh, questions in their personal life, questions of the Bible, some things that they don't understand. Uh, you know, and remember, uh, no question is a silly question. And uh, two Sundays back, a youth came up to me and said, uh, you know, he's, he's been in our church for a long time. And he said to me, I'm still finding it uh, very difficult to, you know, comprehend this whole Trinity thing. Right? And he's been part of church for many years but it's all right and, uh, and he's been serving in church it's not like oh you've been in church for so long how can you not understand this no right? that's something that he's going through and uh, we must uh, have the passion to reach out for them care for them right uh, they will one of the uh, important things that we must remember is if we don't raise up youth leaders, we will not have enough adult leaders because 90% of youth leaders tend to become uh, adult leaders. And so even now in our church, uh, a lot of our youth life group leaders were uh, are, are from our children's church. Right? They've finished children's church. They've gone into uh, the youth teen church. We didn't have teen church. We just started it. But... Uh, they finished children's church, they started serving in the church, and then slowly after serving, they're all uh, youth leaders and youth cell group leaders. Right? So strategize. Uh, start training them when they're probably 12, 15 years old. Uh, begin to train them, begin to give them opportunities. Uh, and eventually we will see them becoming good uh, adult cell group leaders. But uh, and but one thing that we really like to emphasize in APC is to uh, you know to ensure that our youth are able to reach out to any one of us. Right? Uh, they can reach out to any one of us from the pastoral team. They can reach out to life group leaders. They can request for uh, counseling. They're just being open, and uh, we are doing our best so that we can reach out to the youth um, uh, that are going through so much right now right and of course not all of them are you know some youth are just fine you know they just go to college finish come some of them are just working uh, it's all right nothing that's you know major going on in their life but many of them uh, have a lot of questions and so uh, we must be willing as leaders to help them out right again here's the cell health assessment tool uh, you know uh, the upward model the model that we saw uh, so maybe you can take a print out of this and if you'd like you can add things to it um, and you know just do a survey and what what your you know if you have a cell group or if you're planning to start one you can start and see if uh, you know this will help you to see where your cell group is at and how you can uh, how you can improve in the future right so feel free to ask, uh, you know, add questions into that uh, health assessment too, right? Okay, let's go to the next uh, section of this study. We'll talk about, sorry, uh, yeah, preparing to become a cell leader. Okay, uh, some of the points may be repeated, but 
uh, we'll, we'll just talk, go a little bit deeper into the points that we have talked about. Uh, preparing to become a cell group leader now. Uh, even as I continue uh, teaching, feel free to stop and ask questions. Uh, and you can also post your questions. You can also uh, just raise your hands and then we, we can ask your unmute and ask your questions. Right. Preparing to become a cell group leader. First thing, the cell leader's personal spiritual life. Now, this is the first thing. Maintain a strong personal walk with God. Now, this is something that we have to do. Right? Let's read Isaiah, sorry, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 19. Matthew 5, 19. Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Right, so Matthew is, uh, so Jesus is saying this, uh, and he's saying, whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of the commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of God. So basically, the, the, the whole essence of this verse is, we have to do before we can teach. We have to live it before we can teach it. Right? Now, I cannot tell <coughs> the cell group leaders, hey, you must have a, uh, you know, um, your personal time with God, always spend time in His presence, read His word, uh, meditate on His word, ask the Holy Spirit to minister to you, begin to flow in the gifts of the Spirit. I cannot tell others, if I myself have not done it. I mean, I can, but it's not going to be effective. I have to live it first, and then I can teach it to others because it becomes real. Otherwise, it, it, it'll just be knowledge for, for the others hearing. Right? Especially, imagine I'm talking to youth and I'm saying, you know what, you should be you know, this, you must have a good prayer life. I try to spend time in God's presence. You are youth leaders. Uh, you need to hear from God. God can minister to you. Uh, begin to read. Trust in God's word. Um, you know there will be challenges. I'm, I'm, I'm sharing all this, but what if I don't do and I teach it? They can say, "Hey, are you doing it? Are you praying? Are you teaching? Are you?" Spending time in God's presence? Are you reading the word of God? Are you meditating on God's word? Right? Now, we have to live it to teach it. Right? Always remember. Now, this is not only for cell groups. This can be applied to pastors, to leaders, to anyone in ministry or even in the workplace. You have to do before we teach. Jesus was the perfect example. He said, he did. Then he said, go and teach what I told you to do. He healed the sick, he, the blind saw, the deaf heard, the mute spoke, uh, the lame walked, the lepers were healed. Then he chose 72 others and he said, go and do what, I, what you see me do. Go and teach what you see me teach, what you heard me teach. Go and live the way I am living right now. Teach others to do that. I'm going to wash my your disciple the disciples' feet. He's washing the disciples' feet. Probably he's saying, "Now I've lived it in front of you. I'll go and teach it to others." Right. This is what Jesus uh, says about the Pharisees, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 14. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind both shall fall into a ditch. You look at these pointers. These are so important. You cannot teach something you haven't learned and experienced yourself. You and I cannot teach others about, you know, uh, for example, you know, let's take prayer or worship. 
we cannot teach others, hey, you know, we can, these are the things we can receive when we pray and worship the Lord. If we haven't experienced it or we haven't learned it and we haven't uh, tasted the goodness of God in that area of our lives, we will not be, uh, you know, we cannot teach it to others. If we've not learned and experienced it ourselves. If I haven't gone through challenges and difficulties and seen God, you know, just working in those difficult times, and my times of weakness, I cannot teach it to others. I can I can just say, hey, uh, you know, God is there, God will strengthen you. Yes, those can be encouraging. But if I've gone through it, I will really be able to share it with others you know you cannot lead people where you yourself have not gone yes gone right you cannot lead people where you have not gone yourself if i haven't gone into the prayer room spending time in the lord with the lord hearing from god hearing from the holy spirit i cannot lead people there if I haven't seen God moving, the Holy Spirit moving in my life groups and, and, and in the church and my ministry, how can I let people move people to experience it? I, I gotta I gotta see it myself, I've got to taste it myself. And then when I minister to others, it'll it's like you're drawing them to God's presence. The best example is that of a worship leader, right? You look at a worship leader. It's it's not about the worship leader just being, oh, I'm the worship leader. And you'll learn more uh, in, uh, in in worship ministry as well. Uh, it's not about just being the worship leader. Oh, I've, I've chosen the worship leader, so I'm going to select five songs and sing. Yes, that's the practical thing. But I, how can I lead people to God's presence when I myself have not been in God's presence? Right. Uh, I hope you're getting what I'm trying to say. So the whole aspect of choosing the song list, the, you know, the keys of the song, the structure of the song, the dynamics, all of that is practical. But as worship leaders, our main responsibility is to bring people, lead people into the presence of God. So for that, I should be in the presence of God. That's so I should have spent. At least a couple of hours in prayer. I should have read the word, meditated on that word, asked the Holy Spirit to minister, uh, to bring signs, wonders, and miracles, to you know just bring healing upon people. People are coming with a lot of bondages to break off bondages, to bring down walls during the time of worship. Now, only if I spend time in the presence of God in my personal time, it will reflect in the public ministry right so remember this we cannot lead people where we ourselves have not gone i, I, I cannot lead people uh, uh you know in, in a life group if if i haven't spent time in god's presence i mean i can lead them in a practical way but i if, uh, if you want to see lives changed being ministered to I need to be spending time in God's presence, right? Look at this. We cannot give something we do not have, right? Now, for example, this is just an example, right? If I have, you know, if any one of us, say a life group leader has tasted the goodness of God in, in, in terms of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, He's, he's, he's seen the benefits of speaking in tongues. Or he has seen the power of, you know, just uh, uh, spending time in God's presence. When I'm ministering to people in my cell group, I can tell them, hey, uh, you know, maybe some of them has come and say, I, I, I'm still not, I still cannot speak in tongues. So then you can teach them, you can tell them, hey, this is what happens, you know. It's not about us. It's not about, uh, you know, it is God who baptizes us. Continue to look to God. Continue to trust God. 
And uh, here's what happens when we pray in tongues. This uh, God, it's you know, you're just bringing out the scripture. You're saying, this is what God does. Our natural mind may be unfruitful, but our spirit is communing with the Father, and there is a unity there. We are being built up when we pray in tongues. So I encourage you: don't give up. Continue to look to God and ask God to. Uh, pour out the gifts of the Holy Spirit on you. Then you say, uh, you know, you, you can do that for all the gifts of the Spirit, but you cannot give it unless you haven't tasted it. Right? Uh, so we must, uh, it calls for a sacrifice. Right? You cannot administer deliverance in areas where you yourself uh, is are bound. This is powerful, right? Imagine this. Say, for example, there's a there's a youth leader, a cell group leader. And this cell group leader is addicted to social media. Right? This is just an example. And the moment he or she wakes up in the morning, he searches for the phone, goes into Facebook, Instagram, Checks how many likes, or this checks others, you know, YouTube story or Instagram story, whatever. They spend about an hour on that, right? And slowly, it's every day, it's one hour, but slowly it becomes two hours a day, right? Now, you're a cell group leader. Just because you're on Instagram and Facebook doesn't mean God will say, now we are no more a youth leader. God will continue to pour, have grace on us. But in your youth cell group, somebody may come and say, I have a problem. What is the problem? I'm addicted to social media. I cannot stay without Instagram. I, uh, uh, when people don't like my pictures, I get uh, offended. Or uh, uh, I, my day depends on how many likes are there on my photo. Or my, on the pics that I have posted. Um, and I need to look at Facebook, Instagram at least 10 to 15 times a day. I'm not able to break it out. I don't like it. I don't want it. I'm listening to all kinds of things. I'm seeing uh, things that are vulgar. I want to break off this habit. Please help me. Now, as a youth leader, as a cell group leader, we cannot administer deliverance in that area because we ourselves are bound in that. So what must we do? We must first, you know, if, if this happens to any of us, we can just lead them, say, hey, I think it'll be good if you can speak to the cell pastor or the uh, senior pastor, or you can get some uh, counseling on this. I may not be uh, uh, equipped enough to help you in this area because, uh, and being honest with them is, is even better, right? You can just say, you know, this is something that even I've been struggling with. Uh, so maybe you can talk to somebody else. But uh, um, here's the thing: I, mean, I don't mind coming and getting, you know, help uh, to uh, to you know in this area of my life. I cannot administer deliverance in areas where I myself am bound. Uh, that needs to, you know, we must remember this. Now, many times there are many uh, there are youth, uh, not necessarily from our church, but there are many youth who I know of uh, who are leaders in the church, and I ask them, "Hey, how? What are you studying? What are you reading from the Word? What is God speaking to you?" I said, "Yeah, you know, uh, God is speaking to me as usual you know, through the Scriptures." So, what do you do throughout the week? Hey. Uh, have you seen this series that's coming in Netflix? And they're they're watching all kinds of series, right? They may not be the vulgarity, but they watch series. So that's like 10, 12 episodes in one series. And that probably has like three, four series. And I thought to myself, these are leaders in the church. They spend so much time. In each episode would be probably 40, 45 minutes. Now, I'm not being legalistic by saying don't watch. But as leaders, it's a call to sacrifice. We have to keep progressing 
into maturity, into Christ-likeness. That's what our goal must be. Yes, there will be times you may want to watch a movie, so, uh, or you may want to watch uh, you know, a couple of episodes. It's all right, but make sure it's not vulgar. Make sure it doesn't affect uh, your spiritual life. But your primary focus as leaders must be, hey, one, I need to grow in maturity. Two, I need to be Christ-like. Is this helping me? To become mature in Christ. Many times, many, many times, you know, a lot of us students and you know, youth in church, they come up to me personally and ask me, Do you watch movies? Right? Do you watch you know uh, CDs or things on Netflix and Amazon Prime, all of these? And firstly, I don't have a Netflix uh, account or a Amazon. I, I, I don't know, I don't have it. Uh, but my answer to them was an occasional sometimes. I sit with my kids and watch this, you know, these cartoon movies. That's the maximum I watch. And even if it's cartoon movies, I can't watch the whole thing because I'm not wired that way. Right? It's just me. Uh, I, I cannot sit for one and a half hours, one hour for an entire movie. It's very difficult for me. Many times I've been watching, uh, you know, these animated movies with my kids, and you know, I just fall asleep because uh, it just doesn't interest me. And many times I, I think to myself, hey, is this going to help me in my growth in to become more Christ-like? Is it going to help me in any way? And so that was the answer I gave many of them. Is it going to help me become more Christ-like? The answer is no. So I, I, I don't want to waste my time on this. Right? Uh, so maintain spiritual disciplines. Discipline of prayer, discipline of worship, discipline of word, word confession, fasting, fellowship. Right now, I, 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 there are times, right? Uh, I, I and I remember, you know, when we had a small little one, when his first son was born, and it was really challenging, right? Because um, we got to get up, look after the kid, and a lot of time went into that. So those seasons are okay, right? You just hold fast to what God is teaching you at the moment. You spend as much time as you can in God's word and prayer. It may not be as much as you'd like it to be, but maintaining a consecrated life before God. Right? So you don't have to feel guilty, oh, I didn't spend one hour in prayer. Uh, it's all right because we, we have kids, we have things to do. But as they grow up, our responsibilities get less you know, uh, minimized and we tend to have more time, right? Uh, second one, maintain a life that is constantly consecrated to God, right? Uh, maybe one of us can read Ephesians 4.27. It's a wonderful verse there. Ephesians 4.27, any one of us can read. If you have your Bibles with you, uh, please go ahead and read Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27. Yes. Anyone? You have your Bibles with you? Ephesians 4.27. Okay. Nor give place to the devil. Oh. Nor give place to the devil. Let's read the next verse as well. Let him who stole steal no longer, mm. but rather so, let him labor, working yeah. with his hand what is good, that he may have something to give him who has made him. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Zulam. Now, it says there, give no place to the devil in your life. Look at what First Peter says. Always be on your guard. First Peter 5 and verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. So, Peter is writing to the believers and he's saying, always be on your guard. Be aware, be sober-minded. I like that verse. So think straight. Right? Uh, don't just do things in the spur of the moment. Don't just do things just because 
uh, you know, uh, based on our emotions. We may be angry, we may just do something and then later regret it. Uh, no, be sober, be vigilant, be sober minded, right? Think about what you're doing, think about why you're doing it, uh, be vigilant because the enemy, the devil, is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And it can all start off uh, with just a small room that we give the enemy, right? I like those that that four stages, and then and we learned it in, in the series on my mind. Uh, the four stages. Remember that. First, it's a thought the enemy brings. Then that thought becomes an argument and a reasoning. We begin to argue. We begin to reason with it. Right. Oh, it's all right. It's just once in three months or once in six months. It's all right. Nothing wrong. Everyone are. You know, doing this so I can do it, it's all right. Then that thought, if it's not dealt with, the argument, that reasoning, it's not dealt with, it becomes an imagination. That imagination is as if you're participating in that sin. It's as real, it's a live, it's, a, it's as if you know, in a live session, you, know, you feel that you're already participating in that sin. And then four, it becomes a stronghold in a person's life. So it all starts off with a thought. How do you think people get suicidal tendencies? It's all a thought. You're no good. Why don't you end your, end your life so that your parents will be happy? Everyone else will be happy. You don't have to live in this way. So that's a thought. Then that thought gets into an argument and reasoning. So person can say, no, no, I, I should not give my end my life. I need to live. I want to live. I have a good family. And then the, the other side of the argument would say, but what are you doing for your family? You're not doing anything. Nothing's going right in your life. Oh, yes, nothing's going right. Now, third one, if it's not dealt with imagination. So how do I do this? Should I jump off a building? Should I take? You know, uh, should I try it this way? Should I try it that way? Should I cut myself? And these are all the thoughts. It becomes an imagination, so like real. And if that's not dealt with, it becomes a stronghold. That stronghold keeps on coming every now and then. But here's the amazing part. You and I, the Bible says, as believers, Greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. Get rid of demonic strongholds in your life. Right? Be aware there's a reality of a spiritual enemy. There are strongholds. Uh, uh, there can be strongholds in believers' lives, areas in the soul that are controlled and occupied by demonic spirits. Right? So, you must be aware of it, get rid of it. A mind that considers evil good and good as evil, a mind given to worldliness, is Satan's foothold in a believer's life. Can we can we believe this? Right? The areas of our thought life which we keep in darkness instead of bringing into light, those areas that we embrace lies instead of submitting to the word or truth of God's word, these are areas. Satan has us bound in. Sometimes we feel, oh, I am, uh, you know, there are people that I speak to, they say, I'm out of help right now. That is a lie from the devil because there is no way that God cannot restore or redeem. Right? Uh, the scriptures teach us so much about it. That he's willing to save to the uttermost. Our strongholds are thought patterns in our mind uh, where we have become tolerant to sin. Right? Become tolerant. It's all right to watch pornography. It's all right to um, you know think of lustful things as just in my mind. It's all right to uh, you know say a couple of bad words while I speak. 
we have compromised. It's where we have compromised and replaced the truth with a lie, giving Satan a place of influence and a place of defense within our minds. So in our mind, it becomes a stronghold. Now, just, uh, just a little bit of information, uh, a little bit of sidetrack, but it's important for us as believers to understand this. A Christian cannot be possessed by demons because the Holy Spirit dwells in our spirit. Right? In the book of John, uh, uh, you know, Jesus blew on them and they received the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Once you and I as believers, we accept the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes and resides inside us. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, all things become new. So the spirit man is new. But however, a Christian can be in bondage. He can be oppressed, he can be harassed in areas in the mind, areas in the body, occupied with demonic spirits, and that becomes an oppression. Right? Uh, because whose fault is that? We have given entrance of these spirits uh, to the enemy. We have given ground to the enemy. We have not been sober-minded. We have not been diligent, not been careful, uh, knowing that there is an enemy that is working. Right Now, depending on the entrance he has given to them through his consistent thought and behavior, the person, his mind, his body becomes oppressed. Habitual sin, uncontrollable lust, compulsive behavior. Uh, you know, another area could be, uh, uh, you know, anger. You know, I'm not sure, but I've heard of people who get so angry. These are believers, right? They get so angry that they are able to carry these, you know, things that are so heavy that normally they wouldn't be able to carry them, able to carry it and throw them. Remember the Bible? Uh, now, this may not be the right example, but when you're demonically energized, uh, you know, remember that boy, they, were, they tied him up and he would just break those chains and run away, the demon-possessed boy. So when, when areas, it, not only physical, but in our emotion, our soul, are demonically energized, what happens in Satan's stronghold? In a, it becomes like Satan's stronghold in a believer's life. And a person will remain in bondage until he or she makes a decision and says, hey, I must not give into this anymore. Now, some of it comes through counseling, some of them, uh, you know, of course, counseling, prayer, both together. Uh, but some cases, God can just work or can just break off the demonic spirits that habitual sin. Well, but you and I, uh, as believers, must, you know, must always protect ourselves. We are not uh, attempting to condone ourselves or blame the devil for our sinful behavior, but we must understand that it is our responsibility to keep all doors shut for the enemy. All doors shut. Right? Uh, now, we, we also understand that we are human beings. We go through uh, different challenges. We go through ups and downs, and there are emotions that we have, the emotions like fear, doubt, all of that will come, right? But at that moment, we can take authority. Right? I'm not saying uh, you know we can be stoic and there's, we don't have any emotions. No. When we lose a loved one, there's emotions, there's, there's bereavement, there's hurt. Um, yes, but we also take courage. Because Jesus says, don't lose hope. To be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. Right? Uh, so, uh, if if we see things ahead, there's fear, right? Right now, few of our, uh, you know, there are a lot of youth who are going through 
very difficult time because of the recession, the global recession that is predicted. Say, oh, what if I lose my job? No, I just shared, I told them, you know, just minister to them, said, hey, don't worry, God is with you. You know, even, uh, uh, even uh, in the famine, you will prosper, right? Uh, just encouraging them. Fear, doubt, all of these things will be there. Uh, but we counter it with God's word, counter it with what God is doing, and give no place for the devil. Right? Understand that Satan uses strongholds to keep believers from being effective in ministry. He uses these strongholds. It could be money, women, men, um, you know, the things of this world, luxuries of this world. Right? Here's what Mike Murdoch says an unconquered weakness always births a tragedy. Right? So, uh, so we must, you know shut the enemy off. He must close the enemy. So one of the books that you can probably think of reading is Laying the Axe to the Root, uh, written by Pastor Ashish. You can uh, probably take, uh, download it off the website or if you and just read it. I'm sure it will be encouraging to you. All right. Let's take a break. We'll come back in 10 minutes and we'll continue with our class. Thank you.